Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to some of you in peace out to the rest of you. You know who it is. Black horse sign of black in again asking you to hit that share button first because it's more important than the like or the subscribe button. And that's because the message is more important than the messenger. First off, shout out to uh, my subscribers because I've asked that the message be shared and I didn't request subscriptions and many of you were nice enough to like and subscribe anyway and I do appreciate that. Secondly, uh, when I've asked you all to share, I know that you shared because every time I get a subscriber, um, I get other subscribers who will subscribe to that first subscriber. So I know that, that you're hitting the share button. Um, I want to give a shout out to Obsidian and shout out to Don Calypso uh, for because I know they I know they've been hitting the share button for real. Appreciate that. And so it's my job to make this content worth sharing. And that's why I say the message is more important than the messenger. If the message is not more important than who I am, then I can't really share it. This is part two of the exoneration of the educated brother here. And that leads me to my next shout out to Obsidian, I mean, I'm sorry, to O'Shea Duke Jackson. Not, uh, I'm not, I don't even call him just O'Shea Duke Jackson, I call him the Reverend Brother Pastor Deacon Dr. O'Shea Duke Jackson. And that's a compliment because even though I'm Muslim, I come from preachers, but more importantly than me coming from preachers, the fact is that he tells a story in the preacher's style that captivates our attention. And uh, I come from that same tradition, so I try to channel it in the direction that a Muslim must channel it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is part two of the exoneration of the educated brother for a reason. I'm going to start by telling you about my grandfather. He grew up in a southern segregated state in the south, and in his town, his family was that black family that even white folks left alone. Every town had that one black family even white folks didn't mess with. He, his family was that family in his particular township. He grew older, left, like many black middle class families of the time, uh, left his home area to go to college, and then later on to professional school, and he married my grandmother and settled in her state but not the same town from which she came. In her town, her mother was that black woman that white folks knew not to mess with. And black folks knew, just don't bother them and they won't bother you because these niggas is crazy, they will shoot you and you're not gonna arrest them and take them in alive. Black families who are willing to die were the ones that were messed with the least, ironically. Because when you're willing to die, you're willing to take your enemies with you and they can't punish you. So um, the sheriff began to flirt with her from this new town that they settled in, and she hid it from my grandfather for a while because in those days, black manhood got black men killed by white devils, and this sheriff was a white devil. Now my granddad, having white blood in him himself, didn't fear white folks, and he didn't fully know the psychopathic extent of uh, uh, white supremacy. So he told the sheriff, I'll do the same thing to you that you would do to me if you keep flirting with my wife. I'm not gonna flirt with your wife. I'm just gonna do to you what you would do to me. Well, he did know that white folks would kill a black man for flirting with white women. He didn't know that for standing up to white folks when they're wrong, they would also do the same thing. So it took my grandmother to tell him that in this new town, his family name didn't matter. And they weren't gonna call up the white folks from his hometown and ask who he was. They were simply gonna grab him in the nighttime, that night, and they were gonna lynch him for even saying this to a white man, no matter what that oppressing devil had done or said. In my granddad's mind, he knew white folks ain't superhuman. So he figured if I make it expensive to disrespect me and my wife, they'll leave us alone. My grandmother knew that in normal scenarios, white people can't learn moral lessons from non-whites. So they were just going to kill him. And his family, um, who also weren't afraid of these devils, just simply weren't around. They were several states away at that time. And they couldn't be there to aid him in shooting a few of these white folks and taking them to the grave with them. So we had to leave town that afternoon. He had to settle on the opposite side of the state and then send for my grandmom and my dad and my aunt who were two and four. No, I'm sorry, I think they were four and six at that time. So, grandmom must have convinced the white mob that night that somebody had already come to get him. Somehow she can, must have convinced them. So they didn't look for him again, but he had to arrange for movers to help her and the kids because if he went back into that city to help them move himself, he would not be allowed to leave alive again. He had to settle in his hood in the new city. He had to settle in the hood because back then it was segregated. But his skill allowed him to um, 
be of value in this area. So he wasn't pushed away at first. They just kind of looked at him with suspicion because of his shade, but he was recognizable enough. And he was taken in very quickly. <laughs> my dad and my aunt grew up middle class and educated, but still in the hood. And the guilt from not being as poor as the others was instilled in them early on, but my father resisted it and my aunt did not. She eventually gave him to the pressure to blend in and she didn't abandon education, but she wound up becoming a single mother uh, after going to college. But then later she married a dentist from the South who was so prolific a womanizer that he had outside kids he didn't know he had right off the bat. So he wasn't ghetto, but he was country, and this was his appeal to her. Since he wasn't ghetto, he could be so country that that made him a real authentic Negro in her eyes. He had fallen victim to the hood guilt trip himself because he and his twin brother had grown up in their town as the richest black family there. So he had to be subjected to that guilt trip pulling up. So, you know, he could he had to be a real country nigga. And he had to downplay his good fortune in childhood when he finally left to go to college because he expected the same guilt trip in a college environment. Well, when my own father was visiting home on a vacation from college, he ran into one of the neighborhood niggas. And this neighborhood nigga immediately proceeded to degrade my dad and ask him for money. In one conversation, a few sentences, he said to my dad, you ain't never been shit, you ain't shit now, and you ain't gonna never be shit, now let me borrow five dollars. And that's how my dad quoted the man to me. Now most stereotypical deadbeats in the hood, um, for one, they're not even the majority of the population in the hood. And the ones who are that way don't do both in one conversation. So let's give credit where it's due, but they will gladly do one or the other. So that minority that will do either one are still in everybody's faces. So we all have to experience them, even though they ain't that many in terms of numbers per hood. My dad was no exception. He had to face this too. Now this is the experience of the educated brother or the otherwise successful brother that gets out and goes back to the hood. See, the black community is not all the hood and we forget that. Educated brothers have places to which they can go and still be a part of the black community, but not the hood. Sugar Hill is one example. And it's only one example of a bunch of examples of middle and upper class black areas throughout the USA. I grew up in one of them. When I first moved in, it was a mixed neighborhood. My dad chose that for certain reasons. Now, over time, it began to become blacker and blacker as whites moved out and, and more black folks who were making some money moved in. My dad had to move to the city from which I grew up and in which my sibling was born and grew up. He had to choose a neighborhood, and it could have been the hood or it could have been this mixed area that was quiet and safer and nicer and cleaner. He had to choose that nicer area because, frankly, the hood would not accept him with his straight hair, no lips, and a thin nose. And he had no family in the state, let alone another hood in our city, to justify why he looked like this and calls himself black. You can't be looking Persian. It's not going to fly if you look Persian talking about some you black and you want to live in the hood. I wouldn't have survived my early childhood because there were times I would just wake up naturally early before my parents would and I'd be wandering around playing. And at age three, this was a death sentence in the hoods in my city for any kid, let alone a kid unrecognizable to his own people. I mean, a tiger cub unlucky enough to be born with no stripes would be killed by tigers for not being a tiger. And this would have happened to me. <laughs> Now, as it was in my safe neighborhood, there was still the problem of loose dogs that white folks were intentionally leaving out because there were more and more black kids playing in the neighborhood. So this was still an issue. I, I, I was, it was still uh, dangerous enough for me, but it was unsurvivable. Now, I also and my friends in this neighborhood had to listen to the guilt trip of the other Negroes. The ones who didn't, uh, they weren't lucky enough to uh, make it out or whose parents weren't lucky enough to make it out. And oftentimes they were related. A lot of people in my neighborhood, see I didn't have family in the state, but a lot of the other people in my neighborhood had family in the hood. And these family members were quick to tell them, I'm a real nigga and you ain't. They own flesh and blood, they would say this too, because they heard this of their own parents. Their parents who were siblings with the parents in my neighborhood. I'm a real nigga, you ain't, because my mama said so. Even though my mama and your mama are sisters. Even though my mama and your daddy are brother and sister. Even though my daddy, when, he, when he's there, and your mama are brother and sister. They said so. You ain't real niggas, because y'all ain't from the hood. 
So that's what really happened. Really, the guilt trip is a, is a, is a father mucker. And let me explain this. Until the day that we can go into these areas, when we get education, until the day we can go into the hood and mentor on our terms and actually offend this, the dysfunctional stereotype nigger culture in the hood, the one for which white folks are responsible for creating, but we are responsible for perpetuating until we can go in and offend these false gods called nigger culture. We just call it culture and tradition. But it's really nigger culture and nigger traditions. And until we can go in and offend the people for doing this in order to call them out of this, there, there's no reason for us to go in and try to mentor and try to uplift the hood. We are not to blame for what's going on in the hood right now because in all honesty, the thing for which we're guilty is not going in there and offending you niggas that want to practice this ignorant stuff, whether you niggas are in the hood or whether you are in Sugar Hill and you're just trying to blend in with hood niggas, whatever the case is. And this is why it is that what we see a lot of right now is not only the economy, and that's a major part of it, but this is one of the reasons why you'll see somebody whose parents were doing okay and came up from Sugar Hill, and this nigga's a drunkard and an alcoholic in the hood. And then somebody who was born and raised in the hood is getting themselves uh, uh, into a, a nicer area, getting an education and moving to a nicer area. You see it partially, largely actually, for that reason alone. And how many of us think of this? Very few of us do. But that's really what's going on. We, if we go into the hood right now, you niggas ain't going to listen. If we go into the hood right now, especially you take someone that looks like they didn't grow up in the hood. I mean, you take someone uh, doesn't look stereo, uh, phenotypically West African, even though they are. And they're educated and they didn't grow up in the hood and they go into the hood to do some mentoring and so-called giving back. Now, you take someone like that. What are you niggas going to do? Honestly, well, I'm sorry. What do you think a lot of the hood niggas are going to do and how they're going to react? A lot of them would listen in the beginning. A lot of them would be fair in the beginning. But when the haters start talking, a lot of them are going to follow the haters. This nigga, he ain't no real nigga. He don't even look the part. He don't sound the part. And he going to talk about, he talking about our mothers because our mothers slept with our dads. Even though I don't like my dad because I listen to what my mother say about him. This nigga's agreeing with my mother. So he ain't fit because he calling my mama out. No, nigga, your mama chose to sleep with a bad nigga because he's a bad nigga. And when he decided to stay in your life when they didn't work out, she didn't like that so much. So she made it difficult. That's what happens in a lot of cases. And when we come in there and we tell you, look, you're going to have to pull your jeans up. You're going to have to quit swaggering around like a damn baboon at times. You need to take them golds out your damn mouth. You need to stop wearing jewelry uh, in the image of weed and guns and knives and crucifixes. Yes, crucifixes too, because they were an instrument of execution by the Romans. And that's nothing to be proud of. You need to stop wearing these negative ass images. Yes, you have to go through a fundamental, very deep psychological change in who you are if you want to get out and stay out of this condition. If we can't go in and say this while we're offering some mentoring and some skills training and things like this, if we can't go in there and condemn the mating choices of the mandingos and the matriarchy this, that leads to this dysgenic breeding and the need for the mentorship, then you niggas don't deserve in, in, us coming back at all. We're not to blame. You drove us out. End of story. I don't take blame and responsibility for anything over which I had no control. But none of us should. That's a psychosis. I hope this has been a benefit. Sign a blackout. Assalamu alaikum.